thanks for indulging me in that moment, a moment of glory from many, many years ago. It's quite funny nowadays, even in my home suburb in Sydney, which is uh, Balmain, which is where I grew up, walk through the streets down there and quite often people do the double take because they sort of recognise the face, but it's so long ago they're trying to place where they know me from. And I was doing some work in one of the jails um, and it was a jail called Kirk Connell Jail, which is between Lithgow and Bathurst and doing a bit of work with the staff there and I, had to, I arrived at visiting hours so there are a whole lot of people going in to visit inmates, but they get scanned as they're going through. You go through these metal detectors and then they, they scan you as well to make sure there's no contraband going in there. And anyhow, I'm about fourth in the queue and there's this massive, big, solid guy in front of me. Bald head, tattoos all down his arms, tight T-shirt, and I'm looking at the back of him. And he's filling in time, so he turns around and he catch, he's, you know, it catches my eye and he's got the big teardrop tattoo here, spider's web on the neck. Massive big scar on the other side here. Looks like he's been glassed or something. Like, look really mean, this guy, and massive. He goes, I know you, mate. And I was a bit cheeky in a bit of a cheeky mood. I know you too, buddy. <laughs> I had no idea who he was. <laughs> I know you too, buddy. And that's thrown him off because he's probably trying to think, well, where do I know this bloke from? Yeah. So he's turned back around and he's rocking from side to side. And then he turns back around again about 60 seconds later. He says, come here. He says, we were in Long Bay together, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, hand on heart, that's what he said to me and uh, no, no, but we weren't, we weren't quite in long way together. Um, I, my, you can take a look at me, I'm, I'm pretty scorned now, I'm a bit lighter than what I was when I played but um, people say, well, how did you go and play for Australia in that game where they're all monsters and brutes and all that sort of stuff and my philosophy was very much anchored in, in marginal gains, it was all about the one percenters, it was about what can I do to squeeze a little bit extra out of myself that's going to allow me to be competitive because I didn't have the size, natural size. I wasn't as strong as a lot of players. Um, but my my attribute was mental. It was about doing what it took to actually gain an edge on others. So uh, I looked at a whole lot of areas when I was playing, from from diet to mental mental preparation. Uh, I was the first one really to go into the scientific approach to strength training and power and weightlifting, uh, all that sort of stuff. And this was all because I actually had an understanding of the human body because I did science at university. But post my playing career, I really shifted the focus to a lot more to the mind, but back to really to, to leadership and teamwork because this um, culture, team culture space is still undercooked in, in most organisations. And in fact, we live in a world that's changing massively. And if we look at the rate of change from the year 1900 up until the 1990s, we're looking at a, at a space where the world was changing but fairly slowly. There was linear change. What happened was uh, in the early 1990s, the world connected to the internet and at that particular point in time, information transfer around the world was at the click of a button. You didn't have to go to libraries to, or interview people to find out information and that meant that there's a whole lot, sh a lot more change happening at a much, rapid, much more rapid pace. To, to that end, <coughs> it's really uh, important to understand that the principles of business, and you guys are here because your businesses have sent you here, because they're invested in you to take their business to at some point to gain uh, some credit from this course back into the business. Uh, and the world that we used to live in has well and truly passed. Businesses used to be anchored in the paradigm of efficiency. And that means that if I'm more efficient using my resources, I'm going to make more money. Nowadays, in fact, the last couple of decades, that's been absolutely superseded by the paradigm of innovation. If we don't innovate, we're going to get left behind. And to that end, it's really important. And you have a look at the businesses that fail to innovate. They're gone. The Kodaks of the world. The Blackberry. Anyone have a Blackberry phone? Or maybe they didn't, you're probably a bit too young. But Blackberry dominated the, the, the early mobile phone market. Absolutely dominated it. Yeah, uh, but they're, they're not even in, in that market anymore. They're, they're, they're gone. Uh, blockbuster videos. There's a whole lot of stories. Hi, a whole lot of stories of companies that failed to innovate that are no longer with us. But the the, the disruptive companies, innovative companies, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Apples, the Samsungs. You know, they're they're going from strength to strength. In terms of of um, the world has shifted from very much a stable environment, a stable landscape to a landscape that's quite volatile. Okay, it's very unstable, quite, in fact, volatile. What that means for us as, as human beings, emotionally, is that we move from a space 
uh, of comfort to a space of uh, relative discomfort and in fact uh, we perceive it to be quite risky. Now that means because that's what people are experiencing. That's what the masses out there that as leaders and emerging leaders we are responsible for dealing with people who are experiencing these emotions. Yeah? Now what that has requires, it requires a shift in the way people are, are led. The old world was very much anchored in management. Management was all about getting a result. It was about, because the world wasn't changing quickly, we didn't have to worry about change or instability. And I can remember back in the 1980s when I got promoted to being a team leader, because I actually, not only did I play rugby league, but back then you had to work a job because there wasn't enough money to be just a sports person. So I actually, uh, one of the things I did was, uh, I was a school teacher for a couple of years, but I got out of that and uh, I moved into selling advertising and I got promoted to being the team leader. Yep. And in, uh, this was in the late 80s, they sent me on a management course. How good's that? They sent me on a management course. Anyone here ever been sent on a management course? No, because nowadays we're actually in the leadership space. So the courses you get sent on are built around a different set of skills. It's not just about getting a result, it's about leading people through this space of risk and uncertainty to a space where they're going to, going to be feel more comfortable so they can be more productive. Yeah? So that's really what I wanted to share with you uh, off the back of this, some, some insights today. But the difference between managing and leading is, is you know, you've, you've, all, you've been through this probably, but basically the leadership space is much more anchored in the people, it's much more anchored in dealing with this, these emotions that people experience and have and how can we take people from point A to point B in a way where they're, all, they're going to feel united and they're going to be productive. And that's ultimately what the culture is all about. Now, in terms of you people and some of you, hands up those are currently in a leadership role. Currently in a leadership role. Okay, so uh, just over half of you, right? So how do people come to be promoted into leadership roles? There's a whole lot of reasons, yeah? What, what was the reason? So, yes, <laughs> great reason. Okay, so the head of you resign. These are a whole lot of reasons, eh? But there's other reasons. Okay, so if the head of you resigns, I can add that one up there. It's not quite there, yeah? Okay. But great technical skills, strong work ethic, popular and charming, uh, upwardly manages really well, pass the technical exams. Does any of that stuff equip you to be uh, uh, a leader that's going to take people on this journey through? this turmoil and instability to a space where you're going to get, have your people absolutely focused on the, the, what, what needs to be done and united in getting that. No, it doesn't. So that's why we're here and that's why I will, I'm really excited to be able to share some insights today because for me, um, 40 years plus, I've been sort of studying this space, particularly around team cultures. And I think for me, it's it's it's... Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to share it with people. As Jude mentioned a bit earlier, he's, he's, he's taken some of the stuff from last year and implementing it and find it really valuable. For me, the stuff I'm going to share with you is just absolutely practical. It's not theory, it's absolutely practical stuff, but it's built around the science of what, ma what makes people tick. In terms of this leadership stuff, though, before we get into the team culture stuff, um, what I tend to find is that when people get promoted into a leadership role, they take with them these two sets of skills. There's the management stuff and there's the leadership stuff. Both of those are important in the day-to-day -day, uh, business of leading a team. Yeah? But the challenge is most of us feel more comfortable in the management space because that's the technical stuff. That's the stuff about getting stuff done because I don't really know too much about how to deal with people and their emotions and, and how to drive culture and do all that sort of stuff. So I'll, I'll sort of stick in this management space. But what that leads to is it leads to me being so get um, uh, um, drawn down into a space where I have to address the detail. And when, and when I get caught in that micromanaging space, I'm stuck in this blue circle. The orange circle doesn't really show its head. That's the leadership stuff. And if I get stuck in that space, it's a high stress space and not very satisfying. If I learn some leadership skills 
and I realise that I can delegate a bit to people, I can co learn some basic coaching skills, I don't have to do as much of this managing stuff because I can delegate some of that stuff. So ultimately where we want to get to, I want to get to a space where I can choose to go back into management rather than be sucked into management. That's the, that's the principle of leadership development. That's the, my experience having moved through this over the course of my life um, and still learning around leadership. Never stop learning. I want to share with you, there's some research that was done by Corn Ferry uh, back in 2015. It was commissioned by MBN Co. And what they did was they looked at the top 16 leadership competencies um, and that they believe were the top 16 leadership companies they needed because they were struggling with the business to roll out all the cable around the country and they wanted to get um, higher quality leaders. And what they did was they, they commissioned Corn Ferry to do a study and they looked at these 16 leadership competencies and they looked at across two variables. On the vertical axis, how easy is it to go out and recruit that skill set? So the talent supply. If we can't go out and recruit that skill set, how easy is it to train, to develop like this? Yeah. So what they found was the ones that were easy to develop and easy to recruit were down in this corner down here. Yeah. The ones that are hardest to develop and hardest to recruit are up in this top corner up here. As you can see, building effective teams and developing talent, which is coaching your people, and driving vision and purpose, which is anchored in the, the essence of, of uh, a culture, are uh, all, those three are all really uh, part of what we're gonna talk about today in terms of uh, creating a high performance culture. The other fourth one that that's up in that space is managing ambiguity, which is not really so much about the people, it's about a mindset, um, but it's also a significant gap. So if we go back to the, our, our friend, the, the, the graph here that talks about the shift from linear change to exponential change, there's been a shift also in terms of the importance of teamwork. Teamwork's always been important in business, but nowadays it is so much more, more important than it ever, ever was before. Uh, and I ask you this question, what do you believe is the number one enabler of a great team culture? What do you believe is the number one enabler of teamwork? High performance teamwork. Anyone have a guess? Collaboration. Sorry? Collaboration. Collaboration is very important, yeah. It's not, it's not the number one. Sorry? The quality of the leader. Okay, it's the quality of the team leader. But, so if that's the number one enabler, if we go back to the previous slide that I, sh that I showed you, what's the biggest gap in, in leadership competencies? Building effective teams, yeah? Because where do you go to find that stuff? I've been researching this space for 40 years. There's not one decent integrated text out there. The stuff that Harvard's using, the stuff at Oxford University, it's, 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 it's theoretical, it's not practical. Um, and I'm gonna share today with you a model, you should have the sheets when you came in, if you didn't get a sheet, you can grab one shortly, um, of what I call the team ignition model, uh, which is pretty much captures, based on my research over a long period of time, the cornerstones of what this team culture is all about. So, if we're talking about a team leader, yeah, uh, there's two dimensions that that team leader's got to be got to learn to actually engage and to upskill in. First one's working with the human capital. That's working with the people, and that's not easy, right? Why is it not easy? Because individuals are different. Some people under pressure will play the victim. Some people under pressure will attack others. Some people under pressure will blame others. Some people will manipulate, okay? And th they're aspects that we need to, as leaders, learn how to deal with, yeah? But let's park that aside, because that's a deeper conversation than what we're gonna go through today, yeah? But that's part of the ongoing lessons, and there's a science behind this, how to engage with those different types under pressure. But the other part that's really critical is the social capital. So team leaders engage people as individuals, the human capital, but they engage this social capital. It's the ability of bringing everybody together and aligning them in the one direction. That's the social capital piece. And what uh, the research indicates is that high performance cultures have multiple and unilateral connections between people. 
Yeah. The mediocre cultures have cliques. Some people are strongly connected, some people are on the outer. Yeah. And we probably know that from our observations, although you're mostly fairly young, um, in your short period of time, maybe in the workplace, I'm sure you've observed the differences. And you know what one feels like compared to the other one? And it's a feeling. Teamwork, team culture, strong perform performing cultures, high performing cultures, it's about the feeling. It's not about logically saying, oh, you know, we're not driving the results. It's about the feeling. And those feelings tie into our emotional state. And when we're in a, po in a positive emotional state, we deliver results, as do our people. So I want to share with you um, a model today, and we're going to do some interactive exercises, and I'm going to share with you, with you some tools that you can take back to work with your teams, those of you in leadership, current leadership positions, and those of you that are not yet in leadership positions but will be, you'll have a bit of a framework when you do get in, in a position to lead others. So this uh, peak performance culture framework is anchored in a foundation of trust, absolutely. If we don't work, if we don't work as team leaders to build a high platform, a strong platform, I should say, of trust, then we have got a, a flawed foundation of the pyramid upon which to try and build a strong team. Yeah, simple as that. Now, within this, this layer, there are three sub-layers. Trust is anchored in three key uh, dimensions. The first dimension is sincerity. So, can your people trust you or trust your integrity to do the right thing? If you don't think someone is going to do the right thing by you, then you will not trust them. Why is trust so important? And the reason is because it ties into, directly ties into the fundamental core driver of human behaviour, which is to feel safe. I I'm co constantly looking to feel safe. If you don't feel safe in this room at this moment, you will do something to feel safe. You will leave the room if you think the roof is, is shifting and, and going to come in. You'll, you'll exit the room. In a relationship, if I don't feel safe with you, I'm going to close up. I'm not going to share stuff with you. But if I trust you, I'm going to open up. Yeah. And which one's more productive? Absolutely, it's the high trust space. So sincerity is really critical. Second one's reliability. Do you walk the talk and keep your promises? So if, you can, if you're sincere but you're not reliable, once again, still can't be trusted. And the third one is competency. So people will, as leaders, will be looking to you to trust you, uh, but they'll only be able to trust you if you display a competency to lead. This is why it's really important to not just understand what this leadership stuff's about, but actually demonstrate to others that you know, that you know uh, this space. And that, like I'm not going to get in a car with somebody to drive if I think they're drunk and they're not competent to drive. Yeah? So people will be reluctant to follow leaders if they don't feel those leaders are competent to lead. So it's really critical and important to understand that key principle. State of origin is, a, is the toughest contest for a rugby league player but it's a tougher contest for the coaches and I'll tell you why because those players that play state of origin from which is the first state of origin is not until the last week of May or first week of June every year the players that play state of origin have been training with their teammates since the previous uh, first week in November so they've built all these really tight bonds with their club mates at club level and then we get to towards the end of May and the teams are selected for Queensland and New South Wales and all these players are plucked out of all these different camps and stuck in a camp for New South Wales and a camp for Queensland. Yep. And the coach, and I've coached it, yep, has only eight days in camp before the first state of origin to get these teams from being a, to get these players from being a non-team to being a high performing team. Last year Brad Fittler had eleven debutants. 11 out of 17 had never played State of Origin together, right? So, and people say, oh, you know, it takes a long time to, to create teamwork and, and particularly high performance teamwork, yeah? Well, it does if you don't address the basics, yeah? But so the, the coach breaks this eight, and this is the formula that's proven and been proven over many, many decades now for State of Origin. 
the first, those, that eight days in camp is broken into two phases. The first two days, there is no football, no football training, no tactics, no fitness. The first two days is all about connecting. It's all about the players building trust with each other and feeling that bond, uh, that connection. So they do a whole lot of activities that will allow them to sort of see each other, but they actually have a whole lot of conversations that are facilitated by the coach around taking off their masks and exposing the authentic player, a person that they are. Because the media, you don't get that sense of authenticity through the media because they put these barriers up because the media impose on them. Yep. And then after that first two days are out of the way, they move into this next six day period. So this is really critical. And this is what Jude just mentioned, said to me when he came in here. He said he applied this principle to his people and he said he got phenomenal results and still does. So um, what we're going to do, is I'm going to give you a sense of what this is like because it's actually incredibly valuable and powerful. Because in business, you don't do that. What happens is you come, a new, new person comes into, into your business, you have an induction program. What's the induction program about? It's about, well, this is this process, this is this process, this is this person does this, this person does this. But how do you connect? How do you understand each other better? Yeah. So what I'm going to ask you to do, we're going to do a little exercise now, okay? Uh, I'm going to ask you to look around the room and grab somebody that you don't know very well. So in other words, don't partner up. We're going to have conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Don't partner up with someone whom you know well. Partner up with someone that you don't know very well at all and then I'll explain what we're going to do. So get up, move around the room, and uh, grab somebody, okay? I'm going to give you th about three minutes, then I'll say swap over, and the other person will do the same. When, when the, the other person is speaking, let them speak. You are allowed to ask questions because there's going to be some really interesting stuff come up. We're going to do a few different topics with a few different people, yeah? Uh, but let them do most of the talking. So in this exercise, really important to understand that between there and there is everything you can know about me between those two fingers. And typically, in the typical workplace relationship, that's how much I know, that, that, that there. There's so much more to know about people at work, but we just don't go there. Only because we don't see the value in it. Over here is a no-go zone. People don't want to share some stuff, that's cool, don't share that. But share the stuff between the two thumbs in response to the topics. And if the topic is so sensitive that you think, I don't want to share anything, that's your prerogative, that's fine. Okay, but most people understand that this exercise is about, about uh, connecting, uh, about understanding each other better so, so that we can connect better. All right, so the topic is very simple. It's if you knew me better. So if you knew me better, what would you know about me? If you knew me better, you would know I've never ever drunk alcohol. Yep, which is quite weird for a rugby league player, I know. Okay, but uh, my dad, when I was young, uh, he was an alcoholic. He died when I was 14. Um, and when he used to get drunk, sometimes he'd come home and be violent, and that, to me, he shifted from being a really compassionate person to being a violent person, and alcohol was the, was the cause. So I said, I'm not going to drink alcohol. And if you knew me better, you'd know I'd attach a retina in my eye, got poked in the eye when I was playing footy when I was 20, and um, I'm blurred in my left eye, which meant it, it was really hard to try and catch footballs, particularly high balls, because you use both eyes to judge the depth coming towards you. So I was one of the few players in, in the game ever to sort of, when it, whenever a ball was in the air, most players say it's my ball. I'd say it's your ball because <laughs> I just really wasn't confident. that. So whatever it is, whatever you want to share, okay? So if that person knew you better, what would they know about you? Because that's a uh, watered down version of the sort of stuff that over a couple of days the players would, would get to. Um, did you learn out, learn anything very interesting about anybody that you met or did you just chat the six boring people? Or three, three boring people, I should say. Yeah. Did you learn anything interesting? Yeah. So the topics you can dig, depending if you've got longer, you can go a lot deeper. Did anybody, was anybody, without mentioning any names, anybody chat to somebody and they felt the other person got a little bit emotional? Anybody? Anybody in the room? Put your hands up if you ever did. Great, because that's the gold. Because that's what I'm looking for. As a leader, that's what I'm looking for. Because I'm looking for people to be sharing that emotion. Because when somebody shares a little bit of sadness or a bit of grief or uh, something like that, how do, what's the natural response to that? Is it empathy and compassion? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So if I'm in a conversation with somebody and somebody uh, shares that, then the natural response 
Uh, and what we're looking for is empathy and compassion that we respond. And it doesn't have, they don't have to say anything, it's just a look in your face. It's, a, it's that, that uh, energetic response that's, that's connecting people together. It's a very, very powerful exercise. Yeah? And what I would do, and what I do do when I run this for companies, and, and when, I, uh, do it in my sp when I used to do it in sports teams, at the end of the exercise, you get each person to share what was the most uh, powerful story that resonated for them of the people that they spoke to, and you sh get them to share. And they, but they'll ask the, ask, uh, get them to ask that person, do you mind sharing the story? Because I might have talked to you about your mum, but, um, and that really, there was an amazing story there, but the other people were, were different topics, so it, they didn't get that story. So you go around and you, and you get everybody sharing stories about other people. Um, and it's very, very powerful. And what it talks to is this connectivity piece that's very rarely tapped into in the business world. And it is something that's sitting there um, waiting to be tapped. Because people want to c connect. People don't want to sit out there uh, as feeling like they're an outsider. People want to be, be in this this piece of connectivity. What's, uh, and so, so building, do any of you who are leading teams at the moment or in a leadership role at the moment, any of you think you could actually do something like that or any of you currently doing anything like that? Because if you're not, then you can, you don't have, you can just start off uh, with some very, I call them light topics before you get to the deeper topics. There's much more deeper stuff than we're, what we went through today as well. But you find people really, really get into it, really, really do enjoy it. What uh, I want to bring your attention to also is a sheet, that one of the handouts that you got. Hopefully, you all picked them up when you came in through the door. Uh, I don't know whether you, whether you, did you get to pick your handouts out? <coughs> yeah. Uh, on one of the sheets there, you'll see there's, uh, it says at the top, the currency of trust evaluation tool. There's 13 behaviours on that document. This is based on the work of the Covey Institute back around about 10 years ago. They did a body of work which was published in a book called The Speed of Trust. I extracted those behaviours that they, they uh, researched as the, the fundamentals of, of trust behaviours and put them on this particular document just as a little tool that you can use to evaluate or praise yourself. But you can also use this to score the trust dynamic of your culture. So the culture of your team. You get everybody to, to, to score how they believe the interactions are occurring across the team. So not scoring themselves, they're scoring what their view is of the way people are interacting. You get everybody to score it and you can tally it up and you'll get a score. If you score the highs as a plus one, the lows as a minus one, score the mediums as zero, you can actually get a tangible score to see where which, which behaviours we're relatively good at and which behaviours are not that so good at. That then focuses, as leaders, should focus our attention on the ones that we need to improve. Yeah? That's a that's big part of us taking our culture forward. So for example, having done this with many, many businesses over many, many years, th the significant gaps that consistently present are in number one, talking straight, it is a gap. People beat around the bush in a lot of cultures. Do any of you ever, ever experience that? Yeah. Um, behavior number eight, which is related to behavior number one, is also uh, a gap in most organizations uh, where people aren't prepared to have those uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. Um, and the other one that's uh, generally a significant gap is clarifying expectations. People don't clarify expectations very well, generally in business. Yep. All three of those are related to communication. Yep. In fact, how did you guys go in that communication course you did at university? Or the one you did at school? Yeah, any of you do re go really well? Because they don't teach you. It's not taught. Yeah. Yeah. Even our teachers don't get taught communication. And that's what they've got to do. So it's understandable it's going to be a gap. So I just wanted to share that with you. And that, that's a really valuable tool to, to, for you to self-reflect against, but also for you to use as a, as a, if you want a temperature check, the culture 
uh, current culture where you sit and then you, you can rescore yourself six months down the track, 12 months down the track. I want to now uh, shift to um, the next level of the pyramid <coughs> and this is the clear expectations piece. Just because we have a high level of trust doesn't mean we're going to have a, a, a great culture unless we have clarity around expectations. Clarity around expectations sits at three levels, or th uh, sorry, three dimensions. First one is we need clearly defined goals. In your teams, in your businesses, do you have clearly defined goals? Do you have clearly defined long-term goals? Do you have clearly defined mid-term goals? Do you have clearly defined goals for what we're looking to achieve in the short term today? Yeah, and do we have uh, clarity around what that looks like? Because it's a gap in a lot of organisations. And if we don't have clarity around the goals, we can't tap into what's called the progress principle. People are energised, people are motivated, people are enthused by making progress on a daily basis. And if we don't have clear goals on what we're looking to achieve today, next week, next month, we can't possibly tap into that really powerful motivator that's, that, that's called the progress principle. Yeah? So clearly defined goals are really critical. Think to your organisations, do you have clearly defined long-term goals, short-term goals? Are people cl clear also on their roles, responsibilities and KPIs? Because that's, believe it or not, a gap in quite a few organisations as well. Mm. Because of the shifting landscape, because that world's changing so quickly, the roles and responsibilities need to be revisited regularly. And if, and if you as a team leader are not doing that, then what happens is the dynamic of your team is going to be affected, your culture is going to be affected. Yeah. And the, the third one really taps into um, the expectations around, clear, around rules, but it really taps into what do we need to do and shift to take our business forward. Now, there's a thousand rules plus in the workplace. We don't go through all those. A lot of the rules are, are, are uh, communicated uh, covertly by observing people. We don't read in a manual. We observe and we assume if you're a decent person, you do certain things. So this, this one here is a really, really powerful way to align people. And the exercise that I use, and I know it works because every time I do it, businesses, when on follow-up, we go, wow, that was fantastic with everybody aligned now. What I strongly recommend you do is, you, is for those of you who have got teams, yep, you sit your people down, okay, and you, you direct them, you say, okay, what... Uh, frustrations, annoyances or irritations do you have about our business and our team and our culture? Do you have any frustrations, annoyances or irritations? I want you to think about what they are. What rule can we put in place to overcome each of those frustrations, rules or irritations? Now, some of the frustrations are not going to re relate to behaviour, they're going to relate to processes, the way things are done. So you're going to, out of this particular exercise, you'll have two, two sets of, of things that will, will flow from it. The first thing is you'll have some initiatives. You know, we might need to, to get uh, a new photocopy because it takes too long per page for this photocopy or maybe that frustrates me. That's not a behaviour. That's a process or something we need to do. But over here, you're going to have a whole lot of stuff that's related to behaviours. I'll show you an example of a team I worked with a few just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that what they came up with in terms of the t in terms of their team rules. And each of these team rules is was anchored in a frustration that they had. They also had another set of initiatives that that we put in place. So this is what they came up with. Bang! This is a construction. In the, this is a team uh, in the construction industry working on a big project in the middle of Sydney. And uh, they came up with these, this list of bullet points. Yeah. So why I'm sharing this with you, and it's, you've got a copy of it on the document that you've got with you there. Um, each of these talks to a frustration, annoyance or irritation that someone in the team had. Yeah. So what, what I'm sharing with you are the, some tools that you can use 
to tweak the culture of your team so we get into that peak performance space. So we're fully aligned. Yeah? Okay, so to show you how it works, I want you to actually just have a think about this. What frustration, annoyance, or irritations do you have about your workplace? Have a think about one. Okay? Write it down on a bit of paper somewhere. Okay? Don't tell me you haven't got any, because if you have, you're in the perfect culture. Yeah? Maybe there's, maybe there's uh, one of these that sort of jumps out at you. Because what my, my goal as a facilitator is for you to, to learn some techniques that you can instantly put into play that are going to help you create uh, a culture that's going to take you into that peak performance space. I'd like a couple of people to display some leadership and share, share a, a frustration that they may have that, that links back to a team rule. What rule would you have him put in place to overcome that frustration? Looks like you, you've got something to share there, the way you were looking at me. Oh. Fantastic. What is it? Um, in team meetings, people are generally taking Okay. So... So why do people do this? Is it because it's never been clarified that this is you don't do this? Is that why? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we need to have a team rule. So what happens is when you, this particular set of team rules for this organisation, I typed them up, sent them back to the team leader. The team leader was, go was going to um, laminate them, stick them on all their workstations, and, and the next one, th th then we need to then keep ourselves and each other accountable for walking that that pathway. Yeah. Anyone else? Someone over here got, got something? Yeah, got um, one. I suppose internally in working groups when people don't get fully listened to, people work well over the top of it and what they want to say. So what would be the rule that you, if you were going to do this exercise with your people, what rule would you put in place? You'd want people to actively listen to what people are saying in the group instead of just listening Perfect. straight away to what they've said. Okay, yeah. Okay. Actively listen in all meetings yeah we get, I don't need to go around but can you see what I'm talking about there's absolute gaps there and why are the gaps they, because these behaviors that are annoying each other people annoying you and other people they haven't been overtly addressed yeah is that right so the culture meanders along and some people are pulling this way some people are pulling that way and what happens is we have a diluted force rather than a concentrated force really going at, at, at the task. Yeah? Is that, it's, I mean, it's, this, none of this stuff is rocket science because, you know, I'll tell you this, teamwork and uh, creating a high-performing team culture or high-performing culture is not rocket science. It's not. It's all about alignment. It's all about everybody understanding where we need to go and how we're going to get there and making sure people, we communicate to make sure everybody understands. Yeah? So this, this, some of these tools I'm sharing with you are just pretty simple. But if you do them, they absolutely work. Yeah? What, if you were going to kill a phrase, what would that Killer be? phrases were... Um, where was, uh, yeah, so killer phrases were... When, when somebody will kill an idea. Oh, that sucks. You know, that, where'd you get that idea from? So it, that, that's a killer phrase. I'm just killing that, killing that idea because I don't think it, it's, it's got merit. Yeah? That's, that's, it's funny you say that because a couple of people in the session, um, when that was got, the person who, who shared that brought that up, a couple of other people did, hadn't heard it. And then he explained it. They said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Anyone else? Actually, we think we got some, someone over here. Someone, someone over here. Can you just share share one for us? Anybody? Um, just that some of these forces are off behind a time zone barrier, so we're in an international time zone. Yeah. So just forces like France or Orlando quite often. Yeah. Like when we get around, the fact that they work different times to us, 
Yeah, so that's the frustration. So what would the rule be that uh, you would put in place to overcome that frustration? Or is, it, is, it a pro is that more a process? Is there a process you need to put in place or is it a rule around behaviour? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, so th that, that, that's because th th there's some sort of process you've got to manufacture to overcome that. So that's, that's an example that doesn't fit into this behaviours. It fits into an initiative that it, you need to work on to address that. So if you're going to do this exercise and it's very valuable, uh, you would come up with potentially two buckets. One is the bucket of behaviours, and which, which uh, present as team rules, and the other bucket is it team initiatives that would come up with. Yep. Great. So getting back to our um, our framework. The th so if we've got high levels of trust, uh, and and then we have clear expectations, we're still not going to have. Even though we've got clear expectations, we're not going to have a high-performing culture if we don't keep each other accountable for what, we, what those expectations are. We can say we're going to do this, but if we don't keep ourselves and each other accountable, then there's going to be some gaps. Before we get to that, I want to share a bit of an insight around uh, the Melbourne Storm. For those of you that don't know, this is a rugby league team, the Melbourne Storm, who are an outpost, because rugby league's not very strong in Victoria generally, but um, this particular team has been up there near the top of the premiership every year for the last virtually 20 years. Yeah? And they've had a coach there for 18 years who is just the most amazing coach guy called Craig Bellamy. And why, why I'm sharing, putting this up here is because last year, I know Craig reasonably well, but last year we had a really good conversation around Mate, what's, your, what's the secret? What's your secret formula? And he said, Junior, because my nickname is Junior. Junior, if, it, if, if you boil it all down, he said, at the core, it's about care. It, I won't recruit players to the club if they don't demonstrate the care factor. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, if they don't demonstrate a care for each other, a compassion for each other, care for each other, and they don't demonstrate a care for the organisation, then they won't get through the door. And if they do sneak through the door and I see a lack of care, they won't stay beyond uh, a short period of time. Yeah. So he said the care factor, which talks to, it, it, it's, it's talks down in this space down here, but he's looking at character. But when I asked, the, a number of the senior players, I asked Cameron Smith, I asked Cooper Cronk, I asked uh, quite a few uh, of the bigger name players there, what's the secret to your success? They've got a different spin on it. Their spin was, not their spin, their, their perception was, it's all about roles and responsibilities. They all say, the players say, everybody in the team knows exactly what their role is and they, pl they play to that role. And if they don't play to that role, that absolutely keep each other accountable. So there's two different perceptions there. The perception from the players is about, is about clarity around exactly what we need to do, which is the clear expectations. But the coach really looks more, is looking more at this bottom level. He's looking at the care factor, which is about that trust thing. So it's really interesting, there's a bit of a different dynamic there. But the layer I wanna get to now and talk about is this accountability layer, yeah? Because we can have these really clear expectations, but if we don't, keep ourselves and others accountable, then we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to be performing anywhere near as well as we could. Really nothing annoys me more uh, in a sporting sense than when I see a team lose a match and I see the players at the end of the match when they're on the field, doesn't matter whether it's, it's soccer, whether it's rugby union, it's rugby league, whatever, and on the team members on the losing side are laughing, joking, players from the opposition team. There's zero care factor there for the organisation if that happens. Yeah? And that is a sign of poor leadership because that particular player who is laughing and joking if the team's lost, or multiple players, uh, if they aren't keeping themselves accountable in a, in a high-performing culture, someone's going to pull that person into the line. 
In a high-performing culture, when teams are on a training paddock are required to do really intense physical fitness work, which is painful, and they might be doing repetition 400 metre runs with a short break, and they've got hats they've got to go around. If someone cuts a hat in a high-performing culture, other players will absolutely get up that person because they'll, they'll know that that person's taking a shortcut on the training pad. They're going to take a shortcut on the, on the field in, in a match, and that could cost you a, mat, a game. So this accountability piece is, is, is really, really important. And if we go back to, to um, the diagram here, the keeping yourself accountable is the first part. Yeah? You've got a document there which um, it's called self-accountability tips. Just some basic things. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's a habit. Keeping yourself accountable is not just about a work thing, it's a habit that you get into in your life. Keeping yourself accountable for a whole range of factors. And I believe it starts with, with your health and with the relationships. Yeah? Um, but, but in the work sense, it, it's about knowing your role, uh, because you can't possibly keep yourself accountable unless you know what, you're, what, what you need to be accountable for. That needs to know, understand your role and responsibilities. Uh, it's about being honest. It's about being honest with yourself. Yeah, and being authentic with yourself. Uh, it's about apologising for your mistakes. Nobody, nobody is perfect. Yeah. Some of us, based on our personalities, will slip into a space because we believe in our, in our mind here that the key... Draw, each of us in this room has an existential question that's sitting over us, hovering over us. And this is all to do with our personality. The six existential questions. One of the really common ones is is am I competent? And the people that have that, am I, and there's quite a few in this room because I can read a bit of body language. Yep. Am I competent? Yep. So how am I going to demonstrate I'm competent? By uh, showing how perfect I am. And that type of person tends to slip, when they're under pressure, in distress, slip into a micromanaging space. When you slip into a micromanaging space, it's the antithesis of what leadership's about. Because you can't possibly lead effectively when you start to micromanage. Yeah. Um, another existential question that's really common is, am I lovable? And this is a challenge for leaders as well. Because the am I lovable thing tends to, under pressure, people tend to want to be nice to everybody all the time. Yep. And there's a few people like that in this room as well, looking at the body language. Yeah. Um, and that existential question, as a leader, it's going to present, prevent me from having those tough conversations if, unless I absolutely address and, and, and come to the realisation that that's a myth that I'm telling myself that I have to be nice to people all the time to be lovable. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? I won't go into the others because we haven't got time talking about them all. But, but what I want us to understand is that apologising for mistakes helps build trust. Yeah, but it's difficult for people who want to be perfect, who have that existential question, am I competent? Yeah, so it's, it's something that some of us have to really push through and acknowledge that no one is perfect, despite us living in a world where someone will take 20 photos from all these different angles and I'll pick the very best photo to put on Instagram and that puts pressure on this other person who receives it. Oh, wow, how beautiful is she or he? And then, then it's then it's this space where I've got to be perfect. Yeah, that's not that's not the real world. No such thing as perf perfection. Um, don't overcommit. Overcommitment space is is also creates massive issues. And once again, a lot of that comes from me wanting to don't want to say no. I don't want to offend you because you may not think I'm lovable. Yeah. Set daily priorities. The to-do lists are massive. Why are the to-do lists massive? Because it's the progress principle. Because when I set to-do lists, I can tick off stuff that I've done. Every time I tick off something that I've done, guess what happens? At a, a um, brain science, neuroscience level, I actually get a squirt of dopamine into the system. And dopamine makes me feel pretty good. Yeah. So the more squirts of dopamine I get, the more motivated I can be. So the to-do lists help us get that squirt of dopamine, yeah? Um, and iteration's really about just continuing to learn and refine and, and 
I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. Learn, unlearn, relearn is the mantra of the world that we live in. Every year, I do at least two courses, preferably I do three courses every year. I do to upskill to stay contemporary, yeah? Because even at my age, and I'm pushing 60 now, uh, at my age, I realise that if I want to stay contemporary and I don't want to go the way of Kodak and, Bla and, and Blackberry, I've got to continue to upskill, yeah? So this iteration stuff is really, really critical. So that, that's the self-accountability stuff. But the one that's more difficult for a lot of people is the other one. It's keeping others accountable. Because if I'm going to keep you accountable, how do I do that in a safe space? Because what often happens is, because we haven't actually been trained in this at school or university, okay, what happens is, in the process of me trying to share this with you in a sensitive way, you slip into what is called the drama triangle. Yep. The drama triangle is a triangle that defines the unhealthy space of conversation. Yep. So what happens is there's three positions we can take in the drama triangle. And sometimes we can rotate around all three. Right. So say for example I have a conversation with you because you haven't presented that, uh, 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 got that report done on time and I'm your team leader. Yep. And I have the conversation with you about it was uh, supposed to have been done by blah, 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 and it hasn't been done, and why hasn't it been done? And if I don't frame it up in a way that is palatable to the other person using an accepted framework, then what happens is, well, you wouldn't understand the sort of work I've got. Like, look at me, I'm the only, I'm the go-to person in this organisation. I go into what's called the persecutor role. So that's one position on the triangle. Some people will go into the persecutor role. Yeah. Some people will go into the victim role. Oh, I didn't know it was due. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, boss, but, you know, what, what more could I do? So, once again, this is actually a space where clarity of thoughts is not really, sorry, clear thinking is not really happening. Yeah? And the third position is the rescuer position. Okay? Yeah, I get where you're coming from, but what you should have done was you should have you should you should have given it to so and so over here. Hang on a sec, I'm the boss here. What are you telling me who I should have given it to? So I then get as the person giving it, I go into persecutor. Yeah. So what happens when some when one slips into into so rescuer is that person who's generally trying to sort of share uh, a perspective where they think that'll help the other person, but they don't get invited to share it, they just offer it and share it. And the other person arcs up about that, yeah? So why I'm sharing those with you is because this accountability piece, keeping others accountable, is a skill set that is um, in short supply amongst leaders. Yeah? It's not something we go into today, but something you might want to just uh, be conscious of is, is the ability to have those conversations. Otherwise, you avoid those conversations. Yeah? And... If you avoid those conversations, then you're not you're, you're doing yourself your people a disservice, uh, and you're doing yourself a disservice. But you're doing your people a disservice in terms of the leadership because you're not leading. Leaders have those conversations, but they have those conversations effectively because they have a framework that they can work to. We haven't got time to go through the framework today, but there's uh, a couple of really good frameworks uh, around that uh, I think will really make a difference. What? Uh, whilst we're talking about accountability, I want to share a personal story around accountability with you. And it's really the reason why I'm doing what I do now in this leadership space. It was going back to uh, my story when I, was a, when I was a young kid growing up in inner city Balmain, uh, in Sydney. Um, my mum worked in the Colgate Palmolive factory in Balmain. My dad worked on the council. We lived in a one-bedroom sectioned off part of a weatherboard house. Uh, we had the back part of the house and there was one bedroom, there was a kitchen, uh, there was a lounge room and there was an outdoor shower and toilet that we shared with the, the guy who was the, had in the fr lived in the front of the house, a guy called Mr Cook. Yeah? And there were five of us. There was us three kids and mum and dad. We were in this one bedroom and it was nice and squeezy and cosy and all that sort of stuff. But 
that was the way things were in those days. Back in Balmain with a lot of housing commission there um, and it was very much a battling area. People with money in those days didn't want to live in Balmain. There was lots of crime, lots of violence, lots of gangs. Um, streets were narrow, houses were run down and it was, if you had money, people would want to live in the suburbs where they had a nice big yard, pool, wide streets, all that sort of stuff. Anyhow, I, uh, as a young kid, I was always sort of motivated. And because I was sort of, I don't know where it came from, I just always was motivated. My, my two younger brothers were a bit sort of casual. And um, I think my, my, my parents were constantly trying to uh, keep me motivated by, by sort of giving me messages. Because I believed if they thought I was stayed motivated, then um, my younger brothers might follow. So my messages from my mum and dad were quite different. The message from my mum messages from my mum were, were around the fact that uh, she'd been made, made redundant from a number of jobs over the years, uh, in factory jobs. So it was all about, son, you've got to get a job for the government because a job for the government's a job for life. That's what they believed back in those days, yeah? And then my dad's message was quite different. Uh, he, he was a council worker, didn't really have a trade or anything like that. So, son, you're smart enough to get a trade. Yeah, you're smart enough to get a trade. And a trade's a licence to print money. That's what he believed back then. It's probably true now, but it wasn't that true back then. Right, eh? um, so I had those two messages, got to get a trade, got to, got to get a job for the government. And I remember one day I was waiting, and I just started high school, I was waiting to get the bus to the local high school, which was a couple of kilometres away, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and, and next to the bus stop there was a guy working in this ditch next to the bus stop on this pole with all these wires on it. And I was always pretty curious, and I'm trying to look at what he's doing, he looks up and catches my, sees me watching him, he says, off to school, buddy. I said, yeah, mister. I said, I was a bit of a chatterbox. What are you doing, mister? He said, oh, he said, I could be connecting your phone line. Oh, sorry, fixing your phone line. Is your phone line, phone playing up? He go, and I said, well, no, no, we, we haven't got a phone line. We can't afford that. He said, well, he said, um, if you, when your parents get enough money to afford a telephone, we'll have to come and connect it up because that's what I do. He said, I'm a telecom technician. He said, what are you going to do when you grow up, buddy? I said, um, I'm not sure. He said, this is the world's best job. You've got to think about this. He said, look at me, I'm outdoors, working on my own. So I get, I get paid really well, have the annual holidays. He said, um, he said, actually, the government trains you up to do this and it's a trade, you know. As soon as he said that, I went, tick, government trains you up, tick, it's a trade. And then he said, um, he said yeah, no, you really should think about this job as the, as, the, as the ideal job, buddy. And so anyhow, the bus arrives in and then all the way on the bus down to school, I couldn't wait to tell, get home and tell my parents, I think I found the ideal job. Yeah, so I told my parents and they sort of, yes, that's fantastic, that's great. So I'm all set to become a telecom technician. Then we fast forward to the end of the year, which, which telecom is the Telstra now, for those of you who don't know, for I forget how young you people are. Yeah. And uh, anyhow, uh, fast forward to the end of the year, we go on the annual Pierce holiday. And the annual Pierce holiday wasn't to um, Disneyland, like who went to Disneyland? Oh, Jude went to Disneyland, that's right, he went to Disneyland. Or, or uh, the Gold Coast, or the annual Pierce holiday was to a little town in New South Wales called Mumble. Does anyone know where Mumble is? No, it's between Eucarina and Dripstone. They're the towns either side. Yeah. So you still got no idea? It's out near Welling Wellington in western New South Wales, the Burrendong Dam out that way, right? So we pack up the old Ford Zephyr, which is an old car we had, yeah? Packed it up with all these bags every year and we used to go up the same trek up for the Great Western Highway through Katoomba, through Lithgow, through Bathurst, get to Orange, turn off the Burrendong Way, get to Mumble. We get to Mumble on this particular day, it was January, stinking hot, 43 degrees, we unpacked all the gear. Unpacked all the gear, went to bed that night, get up the next morning, we were supposed to go for two weeks. Get up the next morning, same temperature. We were staying at my mum's parents' place. So my dad says, next day, this is too friggin' hot for me. I'm going back to Sydney, I'll come back and pick you guys up in two weeks. So he takes off, takes off. But the unfortunate thing is he never came back because the next day the police came to the door because my grandparents didn't have a, uh, a phone and told us that he'd had a, a heart attack and he was in Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and that we were to get ourselves back to Sydney. We couldn't afford to fly back from, uh, from Orange Airport uh, my grandparents' car was a tiny little thing that wouldn't fit us all in, so we had to wait 14 hours till the overnight train came through. And in those days, all the trains stopped at all the stations. Yep. So we got on, it was about quarter to 11 at night on this overnight train, 
travelled right through the night, got off at Central Railway Station the next morning and there was one of my father's friends was there, met us at the station with a very sombre look on his face and gave us the news that my father died during the night. And back in those days, they never let the kids see the body. So it was hard to process this because they said, oh, he's died, my father, your father's dead, but you don't get to see the body. And then you turn up to the funeral and there's a casket there. And I actually um, started to get filled with rage after the funeral. And I just thought, because for me, life was about being fair. Yeah, and, and this wasn't fair. So um, what happened was I actually went off the rails, started jigging school, started getting into fights, joined a gang, did all that sort of stuff. And I went down this path towards nowhere for, for quite a few months. And I was very fortunate that um, a friend of my dad's who'd been travelling around with his work, um, he came over to my house because he was back, back in the area and he sat me down. And he had a com and I respected this guy. He was involved with the local footy club. And he said to me that, you know, he said, I'm sorry I haven't been around, Wayne. He said, I know you've been doing a bit tough, but he said, tell me how you feel. And he was the first person in three months since my dad died to ask me how I felt. Because everybody was saying, you're the eldest son, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to get back to school. You've got but no one was allowing me to get this anger out. And anyhow, he, he invited me to get the anger out. And I just it let all this anger out. And then he said, I understand how you feel. He said, Wayne, he said, but your dad um, was very proud of you because of all the talent you had. We've really got to start looking forward. And I know he will be Im incredibly uh, happy if you can just start to get your life back on track. So what I want you to do when you go to bed tonight, he said, Wayne, I want you to think about one thing. And one thing before you go to bed, go to sleep. He said, I want you to just have a think about what would you choose to work towards if you could be the happiest Wayne Pierce could ever be? So if whatever you're working towards will make you really happy, what would that be? And, I was, and his name was Mr. Kokash, and I didn't know what he meant. I said, what do you mean, Mr. Kokash? He said, well, what would you love to do? What would you dream to do? that you, if you got there and did that, it would make you the happiest person you could be. And I said, okay, thanks. I'll try and come up with something. So anyway, I went to bed that night and I tossed and turned before I went to sleep and it came to me. I want to play first grade for the Balmain Tigers. And I thought, that's, that's sort of impossible, really. I'll never do that. So I thought, um, what else do I want to be? And Mr. Coco said to me, he said, forget about the telecom technician thing. He said, we're gonna, something a bit more exciting. So I couldn't think of anything else. So when he came the next day, he sat me down the lounge and he said, Wayne, he said, what is it? What do you wanna do? And I paused because I was hesitant to tell him because I thought he was gonna say, think of something else and I didn't have a plan B. <laughs> Anyhow, I said, Mr. Kokas, I wanna play first grade for the Balmain Tigers. And I sort of braced for his response. And his response was, fantastic, Wayne, fantastic. He said, I know you love your footy and I know your dad was proud of the way you played your footy. He said, just sit back in the lounge because I was sitting in the lounge. He said, sit back in the lounge and take a big breath and just close your eyes. So I sat back in the lounge. I can still remember the feelings. I still feel the feelings. I closed my eyes and he said, Wayne, he said, just, um, just go with me what I'm talking about. Just imagine what, I, what I'm talking about. He said, Wayne Pierce, you're in the dressing sheds at Leichhardt Oval, which is the home ground for, for the club. You're in the dressing sheds at Leichhardt Oval, warming up for your first grade debut, your first game in first grade. Okay, and, and you can smell the liniment, the players are, are all uh, revving each other up, and the warning bell goes, it's time now to go down the tunnel onto the ground. And as you walk down the tunnel and run out on the ground, you hear the crowd chanting, Tigers, Tigers. You look around, there's a full stadium. You're playing against South Sydney and the crowd's ch chanting, you've got tingling down your spine, you line up for the kickoff. You get the ball from the kickoff, you put a sidestep on, you run 70 metres and you score underneath the posts. All your teammates come around and they're slapping you on the back, the crowd's throwing streamers and they're chanting. And he went on for about 15 minutes talking about me being the star of this match. 
Then at the end of that, he said, take a big breath, Wayne. He said, when you exhale that breath, he said, just open your eyes and tell me how you feel. I remember opening my eyes up and I remember the exact words I said to him. I said, he said, how do you feel? I said, Mr. Kokas, I feel unreal. He said, fantastic, Wayne. He said, you've got to get used to that feeling because that's going to be your destiny. And then he said to me, he said, um, when you go to, I'm going to, we're going to finish here, but I'm going to come back tomorrow and we're going to work on a plan on how you're going to get to where you want to get to. He said, but when you go to bed tonight, you've got a little task to do again tonight. He said, when you go to bed, he said, you've got, before you go to sleep, you've got to burn those images into your mind. And I didn't know what this meant. I said, what do you mean, Mr. Kokas? He said, well, I want you just to go over and over the things I was talking about, about you being a star in the match, and just go through those images of you being the star in the match, and you'll drift off to sleep. And he said, we'll come back and we'll work on a plan tomorrow. And over the course of eight weeks, he came six times to my place. And why I share that story with you, because that, to me, is... Um, the, it's a great example of what leadership is about. Leadership is, is, about, is not about some technical process for getting something delivered. Okay? It's about the differences that you can make to people, to the culture of an organisation, and ultimately to the organisation going forward in terms of innovations and so on. So... Uh, for me, that was a, that, that's why I, I'm passionate now about sharing the insights around leadership that I've learned. Because great leaders do one thing um, above all else. They make their people better than what those people think they are. And Mr. Kokas made me um, a lot better than whatever I thought I could be. Because I, whilst I love playing rugby league, I never ever thought that I would, for one moment, never ever thought or dreamt that I would go and play uh, first grade for the Tigers, let alone playing for Australia, because I saw myself as pretty puny and just enjoyed the game. But he inspired me to, to move way beyond where I currently was. So to that end, he was, he was the person who was pretty much responsible for me to go on to not just play for Australia, because that's previous life, but to actually be involved in this sort of stuff, be involved in the transformational stuff that I work in nowadays. And I really, really uh, am enthused by that. At the top of the pyramid, the last layer is the energizer level. And there's two real parts to this. The first part is celebrating achievements. And I talked a bit earlier about the progress principle, uh, about the dopamine that gets squirts in the brain. Celebrating achievements is really uh, part of that. Uh, celebrating achievements isn't just about celebrating the big things, it's about celebrating the little wins as well. It's about supporting each other and encouraging each other. I mean, you look at professional sport and they look for every opportunity to celebrate the little wins, the little things in the game. Probably the most ridiculous one I've seen is, um, is uh, watching that beach volleyball at the Olympics. Uh, uh, you know, every time they, they sort of they do a spike and they're tapping each other on the back and they're doing all this. They go over the top, but it's absolutely them tapping into this, this celebrating achievements. In, in business, business underdoes it massively. There's massive upside and opportunity in business to um, increase the way, or improve, I should say, the way that uh, we celebrate achievements. Does, do any of you feel that there's enough celebration done in your workplaces? about the little achievements, because most organisations there's not. Yeah. And the other one, the, this is a huge one too, this sense of hope is, 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 is uh, really important. Why? Because at the end of the day, if I don't believe I can, I won't. Doesn't matter what, doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's you going for a driving test, or whether you having a conversation with, with an employee, or whatever it is. If you don't think you can, you won't. So there's, there's, there's this sense of hope is really important to engender that across, across the team. Now, that's difficult for some characters and it can drain, suck your energy. It's like an energy vampire for some, uh, to work with some people in that space. But 
those energy vampires, if you don't deal with them and don't help them, they will suck the rest of the team down. Why there's a big white space over here? Because there's three key enablers. Yeah, there's three absolute key enablers. This is the framework, but unless we... Oh, sorry, down the bottom down here, I talked about... Uh, where does... Because people say, where does core values sit? Well, core values sit, underpins the whole framework. Okay, the values of the organisation underpin the whole framework. So it sits there as a, as a uh, solid foundation. And that's very important that we, that we are cons cons consistently uh, referring back to our core values, the company core values, in terms of the way people do stuff. Because that's how we get consistency about the, the way, uh, way behaviour is modelled. But the, the three key enablers are the right people, we need to get the right people on board and if the, we don't have the right people in the right roles, we need to move them around. But it's not about just about skill, it's about character as well. Character is a huge factor in this. So if too many organisations recruit for skill and they pay the price. I talked about Bellamy, Craig Bellamy, the coach. He, he's big on the character thing and, and, and his core mantra is the care factor. The second one is around communication skills. Um, it, in that trust document I showed a bit earlier, half a dozen of those documents, uh, those items on that, that uh, trust behaviours document, half a dozen of the, of, the issue, of the elements that feed into trust and trustworthiness are anchored in communication. Yet, there's no subject in our curriculums at school that teaches us how to communicate. Okay. There's four channels of communication. Okay. What we share, and what we're mainly sharing today, is, is, is a blend of two of the channels. That's the way education system is orientated, it's the way business generally is orientated. That accounts for 65% of population. 65% of population are engaged in that space. The other 35% need the other two channels. 20% of that 35% need a bit of humour. If you don't drip feed a bit of humour in, they will switch off. They'll get bored. Yeah. The other 15% need you to be direct and to the point. Yeah. And if you're fluffing around and not direct and to the point and you're not giving them some, uh, some uh, tactile experience of getting up and moving around doing activities, they get bored yeah, as well. So, this communication skills one is a, is, a, is a huge one. I strongly encourage you. There's a uh, skill set that, that I came across back in 2010 uh, called the process communication model that NASA used, uh, I've used for a long period of time. Uh, um, it's, it's phenomenal. I spent 12 months studying. I got accredited, tr go around Asia, around Australia, running courses in it. And, but have a, have a, if you want to have a bit of a, bit of a think about improving your communication skills, in, have, a, have a look at that PCM. The, the third one is this coaching psyche. As a, a leader, I should be embedding, uh, seeking to embed in my team and my culture the ability for them to be coached, but I should also seek to coach. So coaching skills is not teaching skills. Teaching is not coaching. Okay, teaching is about me having a, 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 a skill set or a way of doing things that I want to impart on somebody else. Now that's teaching. Coaching is about me working with that person to help that person become the best person they can be. Do you reckon Roger Federer's coach is a better tennis player and knows more than Roger Federer about the way things should be done? Do you reckon Tiger Woods' coach is better? better Golfer technically than the Tiger Woods? No, because coaches ask the right questions. They open people's minds to what is possible. When Andrew Johns was playing up here at Newcastle, Malcolm really, his coach, wasn't anywhere near as smart around the technical stuff that Andrew Johns was, but he was able to ask the questions to prom prompt Joey to go into a space to explore this unexplored territory because he's such a freak in the discipline that he was practicing in. 
Yeah, that's the coaching stuff. But why I share that with you is because in the really uh, high performing cultures, leaders understand the coaching psyche, but the people in the team, the team members also understand the coaching psyche. That perfection is a myth, that we need to make mistakes to be better. Yeah? I've never coached someone in a new skill in any discipline, in sport or business, and they've been perfect at that first time. In fact, I heard a great quote from Michael Schumacher years ago um, when he crashed off the track and was out of, the, out of one of the series there, and a journalist asked him how he felt. He said, well, if I never make a mistake, never have a crash, I'll never know how fast I can go. It's all about the, the, the view that mistakes are part of the learning process. They're not part of the failing process. But what happens is because we were raised in a system, education system, that is, um, is very much tied to fear of failure. If you, you get a, a, a lower mark than you over there, then you're going to feel, get less attention and, and feel inferior to this person. So therefore, what's the common denominator? The common denominator is mistakes are bad because they make me feel bad. Yep, but the other side of the equation is the only people that don't make mistakes are the people that don't push themselves to extend themselves to where they could be. So this coaching psyche is, um, is really, really uh, important in terms of um, us going to a much higher space in terms of our culture. And I want to just finish with, with one final story, and it's the story of Muhammad Ali because I think it, it ties together this concept of leadership, which ultimately is what we're here for. Uh, here for. And um, Muhammad Ali was an incredibly talented boxer. But um, as an 18-year-old, and he was actually born into the world as Cassius Clay. So his birth name was Cassius, Cassius Clay. At the age of 18, he fought at the 1960 Rome Olympics. And he fought in the light heavyweight division and he won uh, a gold medal. Yep, um, amazing achievement, yeah? That was in Rome. He converted to pr the professional ranks after the Olympics, and because he was young, putting on weight, he competed as a heavyweight. And he won bout after bout after bout when he converted to the professional ranks. And three years later, in 1963, the then world heavyweight champion was Sonny Liston. And Sonny Liston uh, accepted the challenge from, Muhammad, from Cassius Clay to, uh, to a, a world title bout. Uh, Cassius Clay was incredibly, uh, incredible, a huge underdog. No one thought he could win. Sonny Liston was a massive, big, strong guy. But Cassius Clay defeated Sonny Liston. He then went on to win bout after bout after bout. He converted to Islam, changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. He also became a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. And uh, because he believed that the, the Americans shouldn't be fighting in Vietnam. And in 1967, at, at that point, he had 37 victories and no losses. In, in 1967, his name or birth date was draw, drawn out of the hat and he was drafted to Vietnam. He refused to go. The punishment was not going to jail. The punishment was he was banned from boxing. Yep, he was banned from boxing and he appealed through the courts Three years later, in 1970, bearing in mind he had a record of 37 victories and no losses. Three years later, in 1970, he, his boxing licence was reinstated. The courts overturned the ban and his uh, boxing licence was reinstated. At that particular point, a guy called Joe Frazier was the world heavyweight champion. Ali had never fought Frazier. He got back in the ring, fought a couple of preliminary bouts and earned the right to fight Frazier. First bout against Frazier, Ali lost. First loss of his career. They fought again 12 months later. This time, Ali defeats Frazier. So they're one apiece. Then we go forward another four years, and in 1975, they fought for the third and final time in their careers. Yeah. What was to be the, the final time in their careers. And it was in Manila, and it was an outdoor venue, 32 degree temperatures, 
and 95% humidity outdoors. Not only that, back in those days, back in the 70s, the title fights went for 15 rounds, not 12 rounds. That's wimps nowadays, they only go for 12 rounds, right? <laughs> 15 rounds. Outdoor temperatures, as outdoors, 32 degree temperature, 95% humidity, right? Two supreme athletes belted at each other. I can remember what, sitting on a little black and white television, because black TV just came in there, just started. Yeah? Little black and white telly at home watching this, uh, this fight. Yeah? And these two supreme athletes went toe to toe uh, for 14 rounds. At the end of the 14th round, both fighters retired to their corners. Bleeding and bruised, battered. They, they gave it to each other for 14 rounds. Yeah? And Ali, bear in mind, pre-HIV and AIDS, they just wiped them down, they kept going. Yeah? At the end of the 14th round, Ali goes back to the corner and collapses in his stool. According to Thomas Hauser, who's written a couple of biographies on Ali, he interviewed the, the entourage and uh, two of the cornermen heard Ali say, cut the gloves, I can't go on. Yep. At that particular um, time, Angelo Dundee, who's his trainer, jumps up on the ring and they're, they're sponging him down, he's having a drink of water, it's only 60 seconds between rounds in boxing, uh, the time's clicking down. Uh, Dundee leans over and whispers into Ali's ear. The bell goes for the final round. Ali's got nothing left, but Dundee knew that Ali was ahead on points. That's what he knew. So he had to try and get him up. Anyhow, what was Ali going to do? He actually rose to his feet. He rose to his feet, took a step towards centre ring, and the white towel came in from Frazier. Frazier couldn't get up. At that particular point, Ali collapses because he had nothing left in the tank, but he wins the fight. He gets dragged back onto the stool, he sits on the stool to recover, and fast forward, he retires not long after that, and at the end of the 20th century, Ali was voted the greatest athlete of the 20th century. Not the greatest, uh, not, not, not the best boxer, the greatest athlete of the 20th century. Yep. That was by Sports Illustrated magazine. Okay, which is considered to be an authority in that space. Now, if we backtrack and Angelo Dundee doesn't intervene to get Ali up, and if somehow Frazier manages to stand up, then Ali goes into retirement, two losses to Frazier's one. His reputation takes a massive whack and he's not, held and not seen in the same sort of light that he is nowadays. The difference was the incredible leadership that was shown by that guy there at a particular point in time when one of the world's best athletes was really down. Yep. Why I share that with you? Because we're all going to have ups and downs. People in your teams are going to have ups and downs. But if you've got a culture where people feel connected, where people are there for each other and they understand the dynamics of the human species, and that is that we go through the ebbs and flows. So, hu life is not a monorail, it's a roller coaster. And as leaders, it's our role to make sure, or our, our, one of our responsibilities is to make sure our people understand um, the, the important role they play in energising uh, each other and energising the whole team. So uh, I want to thank you all for participating in the, in the exercises today. It's sort of bit uncomfortable, I know, some of the things that we, we do and these sorts of things, but um, has anyone got any questions at all before we wrap up? Anyone got any questions about anything that we've covered or anything you, want, you think I, I might be able to answer? I have yep. a question about the Big Time Daily framework. Did you do that before? Is the Sorry? Big Time Daily framework and the appropriate way to have compassion in it? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's, it's really about starting with compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really about emphasising feelings. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to sort of give you an, uh, an insight here, but um, there's a methodology that's, that's, that's quite simple but very effective, uh, but it's anchored in, in it's called compassionate accountability. It's, 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 um, if you Google compassionate accountability, if you Google compassionate accountability, I think you, you'll, you'll, you'll get some insight into it. Yeah, there's a book called that. Never been revealed. Never been revealed. Yeah, he, w he refused to say what he said. Angelo Dundee.
til de trainer. Yeah. That's about it, eh? So thank you all. Wish you every success for the for the rest of the of the uh, program, uh, and hopefully you've got some insights today. And good luck with the trivia night tonight. We can all just uh, take a minute to thank Wayne for his time.